Thank you, Chancellor Eisen, and thank you, Rabbi Vitalsky. It's an honor to be here in front of such a broad collection of participants, and I want to say a particular word of welcome to those who are a part of the master class and to the master teachers. Um, I think that what can come of that in the days ahead may well be in the fabric of those relationships, um, one of the most important things that happens in the city this year. Tragedy in the Christian tradition. It's a complicated topic to begin to address in large part because the term tragedy has so many different valences and meanings. In the Christian tradition, in many ways very close to the Greek tradition, it builds on the notion that for something to be tragic, it is an event or an endeavor that surpasses the capacity of human beings to make simple sense of it. Now early for the Greeks, the way in which this incapacity to make meaning in the face of enormous human suffering was engaged through the activities of drama. Hence the notion of tragedy as a collective public performance undertaken by a community in which there were means, there were narrative frames, there were stories that were enacted with the hope that those stories could carry away the pain, if not fix whatever had been harmed in the tragic moment, at least bear it up and carry it away. Interestingly, the term tragedy itself in the Greek comes from the word goat song, which describes the song that was sung in these ritual tragic enactments right before a goat was sacrificed to carry away the harm of the community in the classic Greek tragedy. The work that I do in the area of trauma studies takes a close look from a religious perspective at a particular kind of tragedy, and that is tragedy that falls on events which are considered traumatic and the implications of that for community. What makes an event a traumatic event? There's many ways to talk about this, but the definition that I find most useful is one that can apply to individuals, it can apply to a neighborhood, it can apply to a nation. And a traumatic event is an event in which the violence that is perpetrated overwhelms a person's capacity, a community's capacity to make meaning in light of it, and in the midst of which they feel helpless to resist. And one of the things about trauma is that those who undergo such an event can have, over the course of many days, long-term long effects of this violence on their psyches and their bodies. And some of these are effects on psyches and bodies that religious traditions have long paid attention to, but we have rarely named it that. Just to list a few of these features of the harm done to human psyches that faith traditions have engaged is this. What happens when one has been overwhelmed is, in clinical language, a moment of dissociation. A friend of mine who is a psychologist who works on trauma has used this metaphor for me to describe it. In the course of a normal human interaction, human beings take in information through their senses and they file it away uh, as it goes through a big sort of circulation desk at the front of their frontal lobe. And it gets put here, it gets put there, the different pieces, the voices, the colors, the moment in time so that it can be recalled and brought back in the service of future meaning making. In an event of trauma, the information is coming so fast and the content of the information so far exceeds the capacity to file it away that, and he used the image, it jumps over the circulation desk and moves about in the body and brain looking for a home but having not been categorized in the first place, 
it simply haunts you. So to describe events that cause people to dissociate is to literally describe what it means to be inhabited by something that you cannot connect to because in the event itself you were disconnected, dissociated from it. The disassociation itself is in fact, in many cases, the memory. In such events, along with losing the capacity to make meaning, one loses the capacity of speech. One loses the capacity to use very traditional religious categories that might, in many cases, be simply there at hand to use to somehow sort through in your own mind a framework for meaning. One loses a sense of agency, being able to act in the world to resist such harms. And perhaps for our conversations today, most disturbingly, one, as this story circulates, finds oneself in the grips of what is called the compulsion to repeat. That because the story hasn't landed, somehow in the unconscious life of individuals, but also of neighborhoods, of communities, and of nations, the desire to reenact, in a sense, searching for meaning through an event that cannot be placed. It's a, uh, for my own self, a rather haunting moment to stand in here today and to look up um, at the back of the church and to see the sign to New York City and all the rescuers, keep your spirits up, Oklahoma loves you. I'm from Oklahoma and had um, a number of friends uh, lost in the Murrah Building bombing and uh, family members that were harmed. So to see Oklahoma back there in a way pulls together the historic span and geographic span of the ways in which violence rips through us. In the Christian tradition, perhaps the biggest theological challenge is that the core story is a story of traumatic violence the story of a person who was considered by some to be a savior being executed in a very public way, buried and then risen. We'll be coming back to this story again and again in I think the next two sessions after this. But the question for me as a theologian and as a Christian theologian is this, when, when we tell the story of the crucifixion, are we engaged in an act of the compulsion to repeat? When are we simply telling it in a way that reenacts the very violence that is undergone in that event, time and again, upon our bodies, upon the bodies of our neighbors, and perhaps most horribly upon the bodies of our perceived enemies? And when is that story capable of being told in a way that interrupts that compulsion to repeat? And heals imagination can begin to frame and hold such events. And when that happens, that's where the space of hope and faith opens up. I look forward to more conversation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Matson.